Hi, uh, thanks for coming. So yeah, this is about weird games controllers and why I've made them, how I've made them. So yeah, as, as you said, the first thing that I, I hate games pads with a passion. It's something, it's a tiny little movement that it takes to press a button or move the thing. It's not how I like to interact with the world. I wave my hands, I hit things, I... And I don't think I'm alone in this. If you watch people play computer games, you'll see them with a the gamepad go, as they try and move, they try and control the thing with more than just a tiny little button press. It's not, it's, yeah, it's, it's just wrong to me. Nope. Ah, how do I change slide? Ah. <laughs> Ah, no, yeah. So there was a time when it was better. You know, the Nintendo Wii was out, and for about five years, people play games. Young people play games, old people play games. They swung their arms around, and it was just great fun. It was there's all sorts of games you could play. You know, bowling, tennis, you, you know them all. And it was it was it was a great way of playing games. And then it just stopped. The Wii sort of gradually became older and older, and there was never really a successor. There's, there's VR games now that kind of look cool, but I'm 40 and VR has been the next thing in gaming for my entire life. And I don't know, maybe it's about to be a thing, but it's, also, it's almost a step too far. I didn't need it to be serious. I just want something to play in my lounge when I plug into the TV and be able to wave my arms as a computer. Um, so, Admittedly, this is a very self-centered talk. You'll hear me talk about myself a lot and the things I like and I dislike. Um, and that's because I'm just trying to make games that I, or game controllers that I enjoy using. I'm not gonna stand here and say, this is the right way of doing it, this is the wrong way of doing it. Uh, it's just what I enjoy. And you'll in, probably agree with some of it, you'll probably disagree with some of it, and that's fine. But what I really want more people to understand is, and take away from this is that you can make game controllers that you enjoy and they'll be different from the ones I enjoy. They'll be different from the ones someone else enjoys. And hopefully over time we'll find ones that each other like and just have great games to play and great controllers to play them with. So at a sort of fundamental level, a games controller is an interface device. On one side you've got a computer, on the other side you've got a human and you've got to let the two speak together. Um, so on the computer side, we'll sort of look at that in a little bit, but that's, that's actually really easy. On the human side, that's really where you want to focus. That's, and there's loads of ways of interacting with computers. There's big buttons to smash, and there's things to wave at and push and pull, and you know, 50 years of computer evolution has given you all these technologies that we can incorporate in our games in various ways, different sensors, different actuators, different things to bash and wave and things. So yeah, now I just want to show you a few of the games controllers that I've made over the years. So this is one for, it's a game called Boing, um, which is just, a, it's a complete ripoff of Pong. Um, so I should disclose at this point, I, I work for Raspberry Pi in their publishing department. This is from a game called Code the Classics, which, uh, sorry, from a book called Code the Classics, which we published. And I just sort of had a bit of fun with some of the games there because the source code was there, it's easy to hack at. And yeah, it's just good fun. Uh, so as you can probably see, this is uh, an ultrasonic sensor. They're cheap, they're widely available. There's hundreds of libraries and modules for use them in all sorts of languages. You can te uh, tell the distance, you can move it up and down, your hand up and down and get the feedback from that. Um, and I had it, you know, put this together, I had a Python script that could read the, where my hand was, I had uh, the, uh, the game's written in Python and thought this will be easy, I'll just find a way of sending a keystroke from one Python script to another Python script and job done. Turns out it's actually really hard to send keystrokes from one program to another. Um, it's, there's kind of some testing frameworks there it, but it's really, it's against the security protocols of I think most operating systems, you don't want them to have to just chuck keystrokes at other programs and I missed the blindingly obvious solution to this that we'll see in the other controllers I've made. But in this, I had to hack the source code to the game to incorporate the, the distance sensor, which was kind of janky, um, but it, it worked. It was fun to play. Um, 
so one of the uh, no, I was talking about that. Um, yeah, so it was kind of janky, but it was fun, and that was my first controller. Um, so this is oh, this is another game from Code the Classics. It's called Infinite Bunner, and so this is where I realised how you control games. You don't. Uh, you don't plug hardware into the same computer that's playing the games because then you get into this sort of horrible mess of trying to get things to talk to each other and hacking source code and it's ugly as anything. All you do is you plug it into a microcontroller that can speak USB and most modern microcontrollers these days can emulate a keyboard, can emulate a mouse or a gamepad. Um, and so when you plug it into a computer, it thinks it's just talking to a keyboard that can send keystrokes. Um, so um, I say emulate because I don't think there's really a good word for it. It's not a keyboard because it's clearly not a keyboard. It's a book I'm waving around, but it behaves as though it is a keyboard as far as the computer's concerned. It doesn't know it's a book that's being waved around. Um, so when I started this one off, uh, so yeah, the game's called Infinite Bunner, which is Frogger. Um, looking around, I think a lot of people here of the generation know what Frogger is, but if you don't, find an old person and ask them. Um, so yeah, I, initially I wanted to do this. I wanted to say you could you physically jumped, and it's the microcontroller there has got an accelerometer in it, um, so it can detect uh, jumps. I never got that to work, it, because a jump's a fluid movement. It's, it doesn't have a start and a stop point. It doesn't have a point at which you should trigger the jump to happen. Is it when your feet leave the floor? Is it when you initiate it? it just whatever I did, it felt wrong. Um, and after I'd written this slide and I said I wanted to talk about this, I saw on the schedule that there was actually somebody talking, I think, tomorrow, or maybe Sunday, doing a talk on rewilding human computer action. And they're doing things like this. And, um, I have no secret information about that talk. I've not spoken to them. I don't know what it's about, but I'm excited to look, go and see, because I think they're doing things that are more about gesture recognition. Um, they might be able to solve that. I don't know. Um, so yeah, in the end, I gave up on the jumping and I did it so you can just flick the book up in sideways and that's how you control Frogger, uh, Frogger or Bunner. And yeah, it was, it was good fun to play. And I'm not quite sure why there's a blank slide there, but never mind. Um, so, um, oh, I know why there's a blank slide there, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. The reason there's a blank slide there. Um, this was one I didn't take a video of, unfortunately. I got a... So as part of my job, I review hardware. I got an ESP32-based um, smartwatch in to play with, and it, was, it had a pedometer on it. And you could query the pedometer, and it would tell you how many steps you could do. And I really wanted to make a version of Mario Kart that you could run around. I thought, that'd be it. I mean, this was during lockdown. I'd been sat in the same room for a long time. I thought, I want to run and play Mario Kart. So you could query it. And similar to the previous one, the latency was awful. You know, it was, by the, time it took a, by the time it registered a step, it was easily a second or two after when it actually happened. But for some games, that doesn't actually matter. There's a whole bunch of racing games where you just hold down go and just steer. And for games like that, that worked great. You, you ran and, and you moved and you could tap the, the, uh, the button to, uh, watch to move left and right. Unfortunately, I don't have a video of it, which is why the screen's blank at the moment. Um, so you just have to imagine me running around, playing Mario Kart, pressing the two buttons. Um, but yeah. So this, um, so one of the problems I was having is I had these, the software side of it was coming together relatively easily, but the hardware always felt a little bit wrong. It was, it was hard to put together. You know, you, 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 so I put it in a book in one of the times, the other time it was a watch, but. When I wanted to make a controller, how did I go and do that? I mean, there's loads of technologies you could use. I could have 3D printed a sort of a case with it, but then you'd need to 3D print one for each specific controller, and you need to fiddle it, and it'd take a few iterations to get right. I want these to be really quick prototypes. Most of the ones you see here, I was able to create in a couple of hours, uh, including hardware and software, maybe three or four hours for some of them. Um, so you could just, you didn't have to worry about it, it wasn't a serious project that I really invested in. You'd pack it together, play some games and see what I liked, see what I didn't like, iterate again, try something else. And the PCBs here, they are, it's just protoboard, um, it's custom made protoboard in the shape of a games controller. 
um, with the space for mounting a Pico on it. Um, you could do it with any microcontroller, but it worked for Raspberry Pi. Um, so yeah, it's got a Pico on it. It's got, and then you just stick whatever you want. Yeah, some stuff's hot glued on, some stuff soldered on. Yeah, it doesn't matter. All just stays on. So this one, yeah, as you can see, it's got two sliders that uh, you can slide, and. In a sense, it's the same information. It's very similar to you might look at a joystick or a joypad, but actually the way you use them is surprisingly different. It's a much bigger movement than you'd use on most. You have to actually move your whole hand. And also they're sticky, so if you move it to a particular point, you can take your hand off and it will keep doing that. So if you want to pick a particular speed, you just move it, move the slider forward to a particular point and it'll keep going. And yeah, depending on the game, you can you can yeah pick what you want to sort of preset to any particular level and this the other ones were kind of gimmicky you'd never really play do much with it and just have a little go but this one was the first one i made that was actually it, it, it changed games and it made it made games more fun to play and not just in a ah, for five minutes and then throw it away it was fun it it, want, it made me want to experiment more with a different things. So having done uh, yeah, sliders, they're slide potentiometers, this one is actually on the exact same controller, just flipped over. Realize there's no point in just using extra PCBs and microcontrollers, just turn it upside down, solder some more stuff on, and you're good to go. So it's got a rotary encoder. Now there's nothing new about using rotary encoders for games. I think the original version of Pong used a rotary encoder. Um, there's the Playdate by I think Teenage Engineering that's more recently used a rotary encoder. Um, but they they had specific games written for that hardware. Um, this is a more general purpose one. So originally, I wanted to make a steering wheel that you could sort of play racing games with and sort of turn left, right. And that, it worked, it was fine, it was, it was a bit boring, to be honest. But what I discovered is you can use it almost, it's, it's almost like riding a bike. You have to twiddle it around and you have to keep moving it to hold the button down. So in this game, you can see that you have to keep moving it to turn left and, or keep moving it to turn right. And it's, and that, it takes what is a static movement in most games. Most of the time, if you want to move right, you just hold down the right key or the left key. Suddenly it's active, and that's, it's almost psychologically different in the way you play the game. It's, it's a bit hard to put your finger on exactly what it is, but it's, it engages you in a way that perhaps you don't when you just hold down the key and tap another button to do things. Uh, and again, this one, to me at least, it, it made the games more fun. It wasn't just a janky prototype, it was something that I actually sat down and played with. Um, and the other thing that both of these had is um, micro switches on the shoulders. And I discovered that I really like hitting micro switches. They're really satisfying, the little bit, they've got a really positive movement and a little bit of spring at the end, and they click. Um, so yeah, that was those two controllers. <laughs> So this one is perhaps, I don't know if it's a more obvious one or, or not, but it's, uh, it's got a nine axis IMU in it, so it can tell which way up it is. And this one, it's just been used like a steering wheel, so yeah, perhaps a little, sorry, there are a lot of spiders here. <laughs> I don't know if I've angered some spider god or something, but uh, yeah, or maybe they just want to play the games, I don't know. Um, so yeah, if you use it like a steering wheel, you can tilt it, um, and that was, that was kind of fun. But the other thing about this is you can change the firmware, it's just a little bit of code. Um, so the same controller can work in completely different ways. So this can also detect where, you're, where it's pointing in sort of the horizontal plane, uh, tilting on the z-axis, I guess. Um, so you can do that, you can, so it, you can play, and I, I tried it, you can play Doom where you actually have to turn around to, to move the character. And that kind of works, but the, there's a fundamental problem with the USB controllers that I don't think there is a solution to, and that's that you can't get feedback back from the game. So if you use this controller and you turn 90 degrees, most games don't have a keystroke that says turn exactly 90 degrees. You hold down a key for a bit and it turns a bit. So it's basically impossible to map that to one of these controllers. You can turn, and it can turn, but you might turn 90 degrees, and the, your character might turn 180 degrees, and that gets incredibly disorientating very quickly. So that was, 
a little bit of a disappointment. Um, uh, maybe there's a way around it. Uh, I haven't worked out what it is yet. Um, so this one kind of came about a bit by accident. I was trying to 3D print a guitar, and 3D printing a guitar is a terrible idea. I was aware it was a terrible idea, but I tried it anyway. And I think the filament was damp, and I'm making excuses to be honest, but the neck just snapped before I even got the strings on it. Um, so I had a broken guitar, and around that time, one of my colleagues who works for Wireframe magazine uh, sent me a message saying, you know, we've, we're doing this article on Guitar Hero, and someone's written some code to do Guitar Hero, or re-implement it, and I can't get it to work, can you just check the code? And I was like, well, hang on, we've got Guitar Hero, and we've got three quarters of a guitar, surely. We can make something work here. So, yeah, I, I put this together. And this uses uh, their touch pads for the notes. Um, they're just bits of exposed metal that are connected to the GPA pins. And you can, uh, you can detect the touch. And I don't really like touch interfaces in general, but I thought it would make sense for this. Um, they don't really work. There's too much going on in the controller as you hold it. There's, it's really easy to get false positives. I had to do some really janky code to get it to work at all. Um, and it, maybe it could have been designed better with the wires going in different places. But for me personally, I'm done with touch on... Oh, spiders everywhere. I, I, I'm done with, um, yeah, touch controllers. It, I'm trying other things for now, but yeah, maybe there's a way of making them work. Um, so yeah, that's, those are the games controllers I've made. Um, I don't want to sort of get into sort of a hardcore uh, look at the code, but I just want to give you an idea of what it looks like and, to be honest, how amazingly simple it is. So this is the first half of the code for the spinner controller. So as you can see, uh, for just import a bunch of stuff. Um, and then, yeah, setting up the keyboard is just those two lines where you create a keyboard object and assign it a layout. Um, once you've done that, you'll see in a minute that you can just press keys. Um, I yeah, created this, um, this slide deck a few days ago, and yeah, I was looking through it. I have no idea why there's a pause function in the bottom of that. But it is called, and I, I don't know if it was for a good reason or a bad reason. I suspect it was a bad reason that I created that, and you could just get rid of that and use time sleep. But I didn't have time to test it out because the control was broken. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, this is the main chunk of the spinner code. As you can see, it just checks. Um, in this particular uh, module that I'm using, it, it counts the position of the spinner. So as you turn it, uh, an internal counter just goes up and up and up. So you know if you've turned it you know, 10 times, 100 times, whatever. So all it does is it checks that that's keep going, keeping going up or keeping going down, make sure the right keys are pressed. And then, uh, yeah, there's just a button that it just checks the state of and sends the key press. So, um, yeah, that's, that's all there is to it. So I, I apologize about the white slides. Um, everything was set up and lovely, and I was just testing it out in the green room, and for some reason, on a couple of the slides, I can see them, but you can't. No idea why, but this one, uh, it's, fortunately, they're not critical slides. Uh, so there is a difference between keyboard and gamepad. So you can emulate a USB gamepad as well. They've got buttons, but they've also got analog inputs. Uh, I think there's two analog um, joysticks in, in, a USB, in a standard USB gamepad. That used to be part of the CircuitPython core, um, but it was taken out a couple of versions back because it doesn't work perfectly. Um, I've not been able to test any of these controllers on Macs yet. Apparently, occasionally, you get glitches with the USB gamepads. I've no idea. Um, but yeah, so it's taken out the core. The sort of the short version is there's just a couple of files you need to copy out there in the GitHub that's at the end of this talk. Uh, and this one, it's the last slide I put. I was hoping to have a chunk here where I could talk about how you can use your Tidal badge um, to create a USB games controller because it can. There is, if you look at it, there is one of the examples um, uses a joystick to create movement events. It's not quite right. Easy to page up and down, I think, is what it's doing. So it's not quite right for games controllers. Um, and I was hoping to have to have a really quick example to show you how to make it to control games. It's almost working, but not quite. So, um, yeah, that's not quite 
ready yet. I was flying by the seat of my pants a little bit to get that there. But hopefully I'll get that going in the next couple of days. Um, so, yeah, the other thing I just wanted to talk about was in almost all these examples, I've used CircuitPython. And the reason for that is I find CircuitPython incredibly fast to prototype in. I think it's got a fantastic support for hardware. And it supports USB HID protocol, uh, human interface device protocol really well. MicroPython, very similar to CircuitPython, doesn't usually incorporate uh, the USB HID support. However, the tilde, or the title badge, uh, the EMF camp badge, does have support, it is running MicroPython and does have support for the USB HID protocol. So even though I'd say usually CircuitPython's a better choice than MicroPython, for this badge, MicroPython is fine. I've also used Arduino. Um, so the running badge was written in Arduino, which has great, uh, which is great because that can support uh, US, uh, sorry, Bluetooth uh, keyboards and that sort of thing. You can also write it in like pure C using the tiny USB library if you really want to. Um, but that's just a little bit masochistic, to be honest, for most purposes. Um, I'm running a little bit ahead of schedule, to be honest, but that's what I wanted to say. So most of the examples here you can see on uh, that particular GitHub repository. I'm on Twitter and available by email. Um, yeah, most of these videos are on Twitter at various points. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I came here to say.